Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nicolas Pozoko, and today I will present the work Antoine Bonfoy and I did on the question of quantifying calibration, a concept which deals with the uncertainty in classifiers' predictions. When working with classification, what we hope to make is a model which for any point in input space returns the conditional probabilities of this point belonging to each class. Of course, each score must be between 0 and 1, and the sum must be equal to 1 for each sample. Popular belief says that these constraints are enough to consider scores as probabilities, and this is wrong. The fact that a classifier properly orders the scores from most probable to least probable doesn't necessarily mean that these scores are correct estimates of the posterior probabilities. In practice, except for very specific cases, scores do not match true posterior probabilities. How could we check that? Let's explore this in the binary classification case as it is easier to visualize. In this context, we would like to check for each point in space if the score for the positive class matches the local proportion of samples which indeed are of the positive class. That is basically testing if theoretical probabilities match empirical proportions. This is unfortunately infeasible in practice, since one would need enough data points in a close vicinity around each point of interest to compute statistically relevant local ratios of points belonging to the positive class. To solve this statistical significance issue, we can instead group points depending not on their location, but on the score given by the model for the positive class. This gives us a lot more points to work with, and we can compare for each group of points the mean score and the proportion of points of the positive class. This notion is what we call binary calibration. Theoretically, there is a natural way to quantify this, the expected calibration error, ECE for short. It is simply the expectation over all scores for the positive class of the difference between estimated theoretical probabilities and the corresponding empirical proportions. To measure that in practice, the historical approach is based on the intuition presented before. Samples are grouped based on their score, and for each group we compare the mean score to the fraction of samples of the positive class in this group. A weighted average of the absolute differences gives us an estimate of the ECE. Please note that in practice, points are grouped using bins splitting uniformly the segment 0, 1. Each sample is sent to the bin which contains its score. For a more graphical visualization of a model's calibration, instead of averaging absolute differences, we can plot the mean score of each group against the fraction of positive samples. This gives us the legacy binary reliability diagram, on which the local calibration error is indicated by the distance between each point and the line y equals x. As you can see, it is relatively easy to quantify calibration in the binary classification case. Indeed, in order to get the full picture, one only has to look at one of the two classes, since the score for the other class is symmetric because of the summation constraint. When it comes to multi-class classification, however, things get harder. The quantification of the strict definition of multi-class calibration is impossible to estimate as of today, because one would need to group points with similar score vectors, which would produce statistically irrelevant computations because of the small number of samples in each group. To still be able to quantify calibration in the multi-class setting, one has to look at either confidence calibration, which instead of grouping points with respect to the score for the fixed positive class, does so with respect to the score associated to the predicted class and computes the ratio of correctly classified samples in each group. Or second possibility, class-wise calibration, which quantifies the calibration with respect to each class one after the other as if they were successively considered as positive, and averages the obtained expected calibration errors of each class. For each method, the legacy estimation of the ECE relies on the same ideas, uniform binning of the segment 0, 1, affectation of each sample into a bin with respect to its score, computation of a ratio and a mean within each group, and we average the absolute differences between these. In the case of class-wise calibration, this is done c times, once for each class, and all the results are averaged. Keep in mind that this procedure only produces estimates for the different theoretical expected calibration errors. Some steps in the estimation are pure choices and can be challenged. For example, the waypoints are grouped together. Why use a uniform binning of the segment 0, 1? The waypoints are sent into each group. This one may not be clear for now, but it will be in a few seconds. How to choose the number of bins, 
which is a sensitive hyperparameter, would be another question. The literature has challenged the first part and proposed to use an adaptive binning instead of a uniform one. This has the advantage of creating groups with the same number of points, since it is the constraint used to create the bins. All statistics computed are therefore based on the same number of points. This nice property comes at the cost of a higher variance since the bins are data dependent. We challenge the second point, which is the way points are sent into bins. We aim to solve a problem with the legacy estimator. Samples which scores are located at the limit between two bins only weight in one of the two, while at the same time they are the furthest away from the mean of their group, and thus are less representative. To solve this issue, we propose to send each sample into the two closest bins, and we weight them with the weights of the convex combination linking their score and the centroid of the two closest bins. This approach is called linear binning in the kernel density estimation community. Of course, both of these improvements, the adaptive binning and convex affectation, can be used together. This leads to different estimators. The legacy one, which uses the classical uniform binning and the one-bin affectation, the adaptive version of the uh, estimator, which uses an adaptive binning and the classical one-bin affectation, the convex estimator, which uses a classical uniform binning but convex affectation, and the last one, which uses both theoretical improvements of the estimator. Linear binning being a trivial way of performing density estimation in the histogram context, we push the idea further to remove completely the discrete step, the grouping of points, in the estimation of the ECE. By estimating directly the density of P of Y given S with an inversion using Bayes' rule and two kernel density estimations, we can introduce properly the notion of local calibration error as the difference between the PDF of P of Y given S and the identity function. The way the LCE is defined gives us new natural estimators of the ECE in the binary class-wise and confidence calibration contexts. We call this estimator ECD, and the details in our implementation can be found in the paper. Plotting this LCE, modulated by the identity function on the segment 01, gives a continuous version of the discrete reliability diagram presented before. This reliability curve is more precise than the traditional plot, and we can easily add uncertainty to the curve via bootstrapping of the holdout dataset used to quantify the calibration. Now comes the evaluation part, how to choose between these different estimators. What we want to know is what estimator gives on average estimates which are as close as the theoretical ECS as possible. Since we would like to have hyperparameter free estimators of the ECE, because it's one of their main drawback, we propose to investigate the use of simple heuristics to automatically determine them based on the holdout set used for quantification. For binning-based estimators, we propose to use the square root of the number of samples as the number of bins. For proposed density estimation-based approach, we investigate the use of Silverman's rule for bandwidth selection. We justify the use of this rule and not another one by the fact that it produces relevant results with relatively small data, which is not the case with most of the methods. In practice, we don't have access to the ground truth. Therefore, if one wants to evaluate the approximation error of a given estimator, one needs to have a good enough estimation that we can consider as the ground truth. This means one needs enough data covering all the data distribution support to be able to use an estimator with high granularity, for example, the legacy one with a high number of bins which become almost infinitesimal, with each bin containing a lot of data points for the computed statistics to be very precise. The only way we could do so is by using generated data. What we need to start with is number of score distributions. Let's assume for now that we have a very large data set and a model trained on a few of the samples. This model is then used to score all samples. Since this data set is big, we can compute a very close approximation of the EC on all this data. Then, by sampling progressively large subdata sets from the big one, we can estimate the same quantity using a candidate estimator and compare it with, to the ground truth via an absolute difference, which we normalize for aggregation purposes. In practice, it is not enough to do this once, thus we did this 200 times for each data set size and kept the 95th percentile trajectory.
This means that 95% of normalized approximation errors fall below this line. Thus, of course, the lower the better. What I've just shown is what we can get with one distribution and a one model. But how do we generate that? What we chose to do is to create Gaussian mixtures in input spaces of various dimensions from which we sample each time 300 points to train a model, which is then used to score 7 million of the samples from the distributions. This is among these 7 million points, scores and ground truth labels that we apply the rest of the procedure. As you can see, generated problems are not trivial. For every candidate estimator, this generates a lot of 95th percentile trajectories. We keep only the median of these to compare each estimator's performance. Once again, the lower the better. Here are the results for both confidence and class-wise calibration. The first visible insight is that one should not try to estimate the ECE with very small sample sizes, because the average approximation error will be a large fraction of the true value itself. Then, in the confidence setting, the adaptive version of the estimator, here in red, performs worse than the legacy one in black, probably because of the increased variance in the estimator. The convex version of the bean estimator in blue improves on the legacy one, and the bean estimator with both theoretical improvements averages the performance of the two estimators it is composed of. The main good news for the, from this graph is that we now have an estimator which performs better than the other ones and which doesn't require any hyperparameter, since the outperformer here is the proposed density estimation-based approach with the bandwidth set with Silverman's rule, which is very good news. In the class-wise setting, things are a bit more blurry. There is no clear outperformer, the square root heuristic being a good fit for small sample sizes, but being less relevant to both 100 samples. No matter what, the approach with both improvements outperforms the other bean estimators, as well as the density estimation based one. Yet knowing which number of beans should be used remains an open problem. Let's get to the takeaways. If you remember these, I will consider this talk to be a success. First, the introduced LCE gives you more information than we previously had on calibration. And with it, you can, for example, create the reliability curve, which is a continuous version of the reliability plot. There are now a few different estimators for the theoretical ECE, which for most of them rely on sensitive hyperparameters. Then, one should never try to estimate an ECE with very few IAD points. It just doesn't make sense. In the confidence calibration setting, you should use the density estimation-based approach with Silverman's rule. It is the simplest one to use because you don't have to tune any hyperparameter, and it gives the best results on average. In the class-wise setting, I would suggest you use the estimator with both improvements, the adaptive binning and the convex allocation. But you have to keep in mind that choosing the number of beans is still an open problem. Thank you very much. Thank you to the reviewers, to the organizers of this conference. Thank you to all of you. And if you have any question, I guess now is the time.